yeah, title of this talk is Being Black is Killing Me, and That's Distracting. Just a little bit. Uh, I want to talk a lot about mental health issues and, and some that are faced in the black community. And, and this is for anyone, not just black people, you know, like if you have a black friend or a minority friend or a transgender friend. Uh, but I just know more about the black experience than I know about some of the other ones. So that's what I'm going to talk about. Uh, so if you're just interested, this is for you. you know, let's talk about it. Who am I? Uh, I'm Carter Morgan. I'm a developer advocate at Google. Uh, and this is my first time getting to talk about something like this, something that's kind of real, you know, something that you face every day. I'm also a stand-up comedian. So normally I, I joke about this, and I tiptoe around these kind of things, and I try and make people laugh. And so we'll see what happens today. <laughs> what to expect? Um, I'm not sure if there's any trigger warnings in here. Um, I'm talking about some things that are scary, but it should be all nice and good. Just let me know. Uh, we're going to talk about ADD. That's the mental health issue I know the most, because I'm, I'm very ADD. I don't know if you guys can tell. And uh, I'm also mostly black, so we're talking about that too. And then we're talking about anything we can do to maybe uh, help or make a difference. What's going to happen if we don't address some of these issues? What can we do right now to maybe make a difference? So why mental health? Uh, I don't know if you noticed, but that's become a hot topic in even hip-hop culture right now. Any hip-hop heads in here? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I like that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, we had, like, Kid Cudi and Drake get into it over mental health issues, you know, suicide and depression. Um, Frank Ocean was talking about it after some shootings or whatnot, and it's just a black culture. And we've always been kind of afraid to talk about it. Sometimes we're afraid to go get help about it, you know? We're afraid to say, hey, boss, man, I need a mental health day because we're worried about the stigma. Uh, Kanye West recently had to cancel a tour, and some people were saying, oh, he's got mental health issues, mental health issues. So this is something that's like real, at least in the community, in public, and, and I'm sure a lot of you guys maybe see things on the news and you're like, man, I need a mental health break. What's going on? Uh, for me, I'm talking about ADD because I found out recently that I have that. And it's a thing. I thought it wasn't. I thought it was just like laziness or craziness or being stupid. And I might be some of those things, but I'm also ADD. And when they talk about what causes ADD, it's a developmental disorder. And that means uh, basically childhood. And you have some genetic issues. Oh, that's sad. <laughs> that is really sad. I saw someone laugh. Okay. Um, what it is is sometimes you get oversensitive children, people that are more receptive to their environment at home. And when you have a certain set of genetic traits paired up with the overly sensitive child, they notice what's going on in their environment and it causes developmental disorders. So, you know, if the parent is really stressed out uh, because they have to pay rent or maybe a dad's not home because he's in jail or something like that, these are all things that really affect the child growing up and it delays their development. And so the thing is, we learn how to love ourselves based on how our parents love us. And if your parents, you know, your parently figure, it could be adopted, it could be a dad or a mom, it doesn't have to be the mother, I'm just call it the mother. If your motherly figure can't take care of you because they're just struggling to get by, then that child's left on their own. And so when we talk about what is ADD, has anyone heard of ADD? Yeah? I'm ADD AF, that's all I'm saying. <laughs> ADD is a problem between performance and knowledge. So if you look at how the brain works, the front says that's executive functioning. What you do is based on uh, the front of your brain, the human part of your brain. But actual knowledge is stored in the back of the brain. So ADD separates that. So it's not a, it's not a knowledge issue. It's not like, oh, this person is making bad decisions because they don't know better. You can know exactly what to do and not do it. And that's what's so scary about developmental disorders, because education isn't enough. Um, a better name for ADD, because it's not really attention deficit disorder. And the better name would be intention deficit disorder, because you can't do what you know. You can have all the best intentions and not act on it. But another name for it is executive functioning deficit disorder. And you might notice some of these things, like having trouble managing time or having time myopia, deadlines. I am the worst procrastinator in the world. This talk got written at like 7 AM. <laughs> I'm sorry, Ash. <laughs> Trouble staying attention and trouble self-regulating. And so what self-regulation is, is, is it's pausing your impulses. Um, maybe something happens in your environment. A boss says something that triggers you, makes you upset. And, and normal, functioning, healthy human beings can stop and say, woosah, before they do anything else. But people with ADD, they just act. 
sometimes are impulsive. There's seven types of executive functions, uh, and these normally develop normally through like a healthy childhood. There's metacognition or talking to yourself. So if, you, if anyone has children or has been around little children, they talk all the time. They just, they're talking through everything because they haven't learned how to internalize it yet. And then once they internalize it, they learn how to uh, control themselves and maybe not act on every single impulse that comes up. And then as they get older, they learn nonverbal, nonverbal and ver verbal me working memory. That was tough. Nonverbal and verbal working memory. So they're able to process things and hold information in their head, like goals or relationships with other people. Then there's emotional and motivational self-regulation, or EQ, some people call it. Uh, so when you get angry, not cursing someone out. And then there's planning and problem solving. And so ADD is, is an issue with all of these. And it's really interesting because there's four transitions as you go. Uh, you go from external to internal, being able to you know, put everything out there in the world to just talking to yourself and, and self-regulating yourself. Um, caring, get, having to get direction from other people to directing yourself. Like a little kid, a two-year-old, a three-year-old, needs a mother or a father or someone to say, hey, go to the bathroom, go to bed, all this. As we get older, we're supposed to be able to do that with ourselves. We're supposed to be able to say, hey, I'm going to go to the store and get fruits because I haven't ate any in three months. There's a temporal now to the future. And people with ADD, they're living in the present nonstop. And that's where that time myopia comes from. Because if there's a deadline a week from now, like an Otterkopf conference two weeks from now, <laughs> until it's right in front of you on the calendar, you don't see it. You don't notice it. And then finally, immediate to delayed gratification. For any kind of goal planning or trying to accomplish things, it takes time, step-by-step -step progress over time. So when you have these kind of developmental disorders, it can be really difficult to work towards that because you're always in the now. What can I get now? And so, I love this look. <laughs> Just ask me about color people, Tom. Because when we, we've, anyone heard of uh, CPT? Yeah, hands in the back, yeah. <laughs> well, that sounds a lot like ADD. And so I heard this and I'm like, that's interesting. And you know, stereotypes are not always true. So I don't believe everything you hear, but it made me think about the black experience. How is this related, right? So this is a developmental disorder. So how we grow up in the environment we grow up in is affecting our brains and our development. Well, when you look at the home life, uh, everyone knows Trayvon Martin. Well, black in America, a lot of times it feels like you're guilty. And this isn't a talk just for black people. Again, this is my experience. Um, I don't know what it's like to be transgender or a woman. And sometimes maybe in the work environment or maybe how people treat you, you feel like you're guilty of something or you're being judged. So I'm talking about this and maybe help me understand how it relates to you and your issues. But so I have friends tell me, uh, I was like, yo, when did you realize that racism was a thing? Right? Because a lot of people, they had, we had Barack Obama, president. We're post-racial American. I had a friend, really nice lady, really sweet. And her brother is adopted, and he's black. She's white. And I said, well, when did you, you know, realize racism was still a thing? She goes, when I saw Get Out, the movie Get Out, because he had a very different response to it. There's a scene in the end. I don't want to spoil it for anyone who hasn't seen it, but I'm going to. So the <laughs> There's a scene at the end where a cop shows up, and you think, oh no, the main character is going to die. Well, I did. Um, but other people uh, that maybe didn't have my experiences thought, yes, the hero is safe. And that's when she realized, like, oh, racism is still a thing. There's more, too. Like, sometimes I read headlines, and I'm literally like, yo, what is going on, America? <laughs> this is a real headline. I'm just going to, Fox News racial discrimination suit alleges Black female employees are forced to arm wrestle. That's 2017. Exactly, what would Trump say? So it's, it's a scary time. I actually saw this talk recently by Sean King. It, it, no, it's not gonna happen all the time. I just get super distracted, guys. For me? It's my fault. All right. So, uh, I saw this talk from Sean King, and he's a, he's a uh, Black Lives uh, Justice writer for New York Post or Times. And he told me this thing that it's the worst time in history for black America, and we don't realize it, and we're acting like it's not. And that's why I came out and talked, and that's why I'm so thankful for Ash and Altercom. Because instead of talking about you know, work issues and making someone's job better, I really wanted to help and make the experience better for people that look like me, or maybe even that don't. 
And so he said, look, 100, over 100 black people in 2015 uh, got shot and they were unarmed and they got killed and there weren't a lot of convictions and, and that's a scary number. It's the most since 1900. And he gave a lot of other statistics, uh, like the, the largest hate crime in America. Wasn't in 1960, wasn't in 1900. That was Dylan Roof, you know, within the last two years. And in a bunch of other statistics, and it got me thinking, you know, like, like 2016. 2016 was a hard year for people that look like me. And I'm, I'm talking about black, not beautiful, just in case you're confused. Because <laughs> people that look like me got shot for things like carrying CDs. And that made me wonder, like, who was buying CDs in 2016? <laughs> serious issues. But no, I'm serious. Um, when we look at the numbers and, and you look at some of the statistics, how many people got convicted for any of these shootings? Out of 100, 10 people got charged with some of them. Some like two got actually convicted. And that was 2015. It didn't, didn't get much better in 2016. And it doesn't look like it's trending up or down, I guess, in 2017. This is a scary time specifically for black Americans, but there's a, other rights and stuff for other groups of people that are under, that are being targeted right now. But we're in Seattle, and Seattle is great, right? It's a safety, sanctuary city, you know? <laughs> Seattle, I mean, so America's like 87% white. Seattle's like 127%, but it's still a nice, <laughs> it's a nice place. But even Seattle was sanctioned federally for, uh, police, there's an oversight committee saying, hey, uh, how you guys are policing minorities is cruel and wrong. And so they were under federal jurisdiction to fix that. And that was 2011 or 2012. Police use of force in Seattle, it's rare, but if you look at the numbers of how many uh, Latinos versus how many white versus how many black people are getting beat up by cops, black people are disproportionately affected. We're 7% of the population, but we're something like 35% of the people getting beat up. And I'm a lover, not a fighter. But there's more. We look at jailing. And so why does this matter? So again, if parents are stressed out, right? If you live your life afraid of a uh, traffic stop, that stress is going to be at home with their kids. And that's going to affect them as they grow and they develop. And then they might end up with regulation problems. And then uh, they might not be able to be as successful because they're stressed out or they can't regulate themselves. We look at things like jail and broken homes. There's a little graph there, but America has the most people in jail out of any civilized nation ever in the history of the world. At three million. That's a lot. Um, and if you look at the trend here, it, it was around 200,000 for a long time. And then somewhere around 1971, there's a drastic spike up. Does anyone know what happened in 71? The drug law. Drug, there we go. Yeah, Nixon's war on drugs, which really ended up being a war on black people. And so if you look at the amount of people uh, in jail, something like eight times the amount of, my math might be wrong, like six times the amount of black people than white people in jail. If you look at the numbers for who uses drugs and who's getting arrested for drugs, it's really disproportionately affecting the black community. And that means these are people that aren't home to take care of their children, to help out uh, the primary caregiver, to build a support network. And, and so, again, that was a long time ago. That was 71. But if we're looking at it today, Jeff Sessions wants to bring back the war on drugs. And there's headlines that we're seeing like this every single day. I remember there was a few months where I couldn't go to any conferences. This was 2016. Because of everything I was seeing on the news, I just couldn't, I couldn't talk about tech when this was going on. And that kind of stress. And I'm sure some of you have felt it. But there's more, right? If you look at income and inequality, poor people have it rough. People that, like I'm, I'm privileged, I work at Google, I get paid well for what I do, but I know a lot of people that don't, and they're struggling, and they can't take days off of work. Um, and if you look at just income inequality among races, black people, Hispanic people, women, we're all underpaid compared to white men, especially in tech. Owning homes, medium household wealth, we have like 10%, and there's more. Anyone see the news recently, the healthcare laws? It's kind of a big deal, right? So it's basically our way of life as people is under attack right now. This is the worst time in history in a lot of ways. And we act like it's not. We're just going on about our lives. And these things affect us, but they also affect the next generation. I don't have children yet, 
because I'm not a real adult. But one day I might. <laughs> and so I just want to say, what's going on in America, right? Don't vote for me. I'm not an adult. But <laughs> what can we do about this? Like, what steps can we take? Because sometimes you probably feel overwhelmed. Like, there are so many things that you could do. What's the thing that you should do? And then if you do something, even if it's nonviolent, even if it doesn't affect anyone else, you're going to get, or you might worry about getting attacked for it. I see women online all the time afraid to post things because of the feedback they get. Not the feedback, the, the vitriol. Is that how I use that word right? Yeah. Yep. Proud of myself. <laughs> so what kills me here is Colin Kaepernick. It, I'm just going to compare myself to him because he's an NFL player. Um, <laughs> We're both not in the NFL right now, and it could be because they're being blackballed. I don't know. He was a 4.0 student. He's a top one percenter in his field. Been to a Super Bowl. He protested nonviolently, has donated millions of dollars to causes he believes in to help people. And he can get blackballed for standing up for that. So someone like me, who could maybe be in the NFL in some reality, like what chance do I have, right? And that's what bothers me about that so much. So what can we do? One thing I know is that as underrepresented groups, we have to overrepresent. We can't afford to sit out. We have to be involved. Because if our voices aren't being heard, then we're not going to be making changes and moving the needle. And so local activism is a, is a, is a good place to start. Local activism does have some effects. Like we see, uh, anyone hear about Block the Bunker, the youth jail in Seattle? So Seattle under sanctions is like, yo, OK, we're under sanctions, sure. But just for fun, let's build a $150 million militarized police bunker. And they've been trying to push this through for years now. And local activism hasn't stopped it, but it has delayed it. Right? And so getting involved locally can make a difference. But there's a problem with that. And the problem is we have jobs. Who here has a life? <laughs> Not all you raised hands. <laughs> if you need to talk after, let me know. But we have jobs. We can't afford to always be at meetings and always be being an activist. A lot of times these council meetings are in the middle of the day, like Monday at 2 p.m., 3 p.m., almost like they don't want us to be involved, right? So what can we do? And I think the single most important thing we can do is, in, 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 is actually vote for people that are, that are vote on our behalf and that aren't tied into corporate interest and aren't tied into corporate uh, money. And so here's three people running soon for mayor. One's already on city council. One's trying to run for city council. Uh, so Nikita Oliver, Keshama Sawan, and John Grant, they all care very much about affordable housing so that Seattle can be a place that you can afford to live um, without having to live so far away and travel so far into work, without having to be stressed all the time, like, can I make rent? Can I make rent? Um, John Grant specifically, Nikita Oliver specifically, have talked about police oversight, and that's, that's a big part of their campaign and what they're pushing for. Um, and there's a lot more. So the number one most important thing we can be doing right now is getting people like this who are going to vote on our behalf and act on our behalf while we're still working and living our lives and hopefully eating fruits every three months into office. So if there's one takeaway from this, it's that everyday stress affects us you know, if you're scared to go outside, if you're scared to get in the car because you're afraid to get pulled over, that everything that you've worked for could be gone that quick, that you're taking that stress home. And that means the next generation, they're living with that stress and they're growing up with it. So what we need to be doing, however we can, is electing people to fight on our behalf. And it doesn't seem like that's going to happen at the federal level right now. So start close to home. Thanks.